my name is Dr. Amir Oryan, and I'm in the Pollock Cancer Center at the Faculty of Medicine. And my lab is the Ruth and Stan Flinkman Laboratory for Genetic Networks. And my lab actually studies Drosophila, fruit flies, as a way to study cancer. Fruit flies are old organisms that used for genetics for about 100 years ago. But in the last two decades, we discovered that actually we can learn about a lot about curing cancer and studying cancer by using them as a model system, which is very efficient and very powerful. They have only four chromosomes, so the DNA is much smaller and organized more simple to the human genome, which contains many chromosomes. And many genes that are in humans are represented as families, are uh, represented as single genes in fruit flies. So it's much easier to deal with them. because It's not a big Italian or Jewish family. It's a really simple uh, case of single genes that can mimic the human genes very accurately, the big families. Fruit flies have many other advantages. They have a very rapid lifespan. It's easy to host them. You can see behind me thousands of fruit flies all representing different genes that are involved in cancer. And if we had to host these in mice, we had to have like a whole tower of the Faculty of Medicine just to hold them. But again, they keep the same principles uh, or they can represent and allow us to study the basic principles of how cancer cells evolve, what are the basic processes that regulate it. When we talk about cancer-related genes, about 70 to 80 percent of the human genes that are involved in disease and specifically in cancer are very similar or have very similar homologs in fruit flies. And my lab specifically is interested in to understand genes that actually regulate the DNA of normal cells and then when they are misregulated, this would result in cancer. A good example that I like to give is this gene MIC. It's a gene that is shared by all humans, fruit flies, zebrafish, monkeys, zebra, camels. They all have this gene and it's crucial for their development. Flies that have no milk would die very early. They would not make an embryo. On the other hand, too much of it, when it's misregulated, leads to cancer. One interesting point on milk, but is related to other factors, is that milk by itself is like a CAO. It di dictates the function and activity of thousands of genes in a given moment. So we really have a very big technical problem, how we can monitor one gene that really regulates tons of other genes. Think of somebody who's in charge of all the red lights in California, and you really want to know for each red light, whether it's green, red, or yellow, so you need to discover a, a simple system to study it, and you need to have a way that you can, at the same time, look on all the red lights in a given moment. These technologies are now available because the Drosophila DNA, what we call, uh, what we call a genome, is much more simple. Uh, it is much easier to track these events and we can make maps using very sophisticated equipment and tell you how one regulator like MIC controls thousands of genes that are our, our uh, red lights. An interesting point here is that MIC doesn't work by itself. Like any good CAO it has a that has a secretary and a driver and a Blackberry or an iPhone, MIC has those accessories. They are called cofactors. So they associate with MIC and it brings them to the DNA and then they help him to regulate other genes. Without them, it's like a CAO with no secretary, no phone, no iPhone, no internet. It's a dead person walking. So make without its cofactors is dead. It binds to DNA, but will do nothing. So therefore, in the last few years, we have decided to shift a little bit and to focus on these cofactors. They all have enzymatic activities. This means that we can inhibit them. We can do to them things, and by that, modulate the activity and the big picture. So if MIC is involved in cancer, halting MIC function or activity would stop cancer. But it's almost impossible to stop MIC itself, but we can target uh, its cofactors, its associated working factors. And currently, two-thirds of my lab is focusing not just on MIC, 
but on genes that are make helpers. So the concept that my lab works is that we try to make those big maps. We want to know who controls what, where are the red lights, who turns off the lights, who bring them up. After we make those big maps, we go back to this room, which is the room we rear our flies, and do genetic experiments that originate from findings that we uh, discover by making those maps. We found those genetic connections in fruit flies. And then we don't stop, but we ask, are the findings that we find in fruit flies relevant to human cancer and human cancer cells? So we go to the other third of the lab that actually deals with testing our findings from the Drosophila into tissue culture, uh, culture is cancer cells that go on plastics or in simple mice models and ask, can we really use the finding from Drosophila fruit flies and learn lessons in cancer? In at least now for the gene that we pick to focus on, the answer is uh, widely yes. And I think it, it is turning to be a very promising system. It is not only a promising system for discovery and to get concept, but it's also a very good system for testing compounds in uh, bioactive materials that can use to treat cancer, or at least in vitro or in the lab, in early days. Because it's very easy to feed fruit flies with different small molecules that we think may target a cofactor. This is much, much, much more easier than to do it in mice or only in advanced stages in, in humans. So it really gives us a very versatile tool, A, to make predictions, to test them, immediately to link what we see in the fruit fly into cancer cells and go back into the fruit flies and test compounds and things that we're interested to test as possible targets or genes that are relevant for early detection using the fruit flies as a system to study cancer cells. I'll give a simple example of an experiment that we can uh, do in fruit flies and later on transfer it and how we transfer it into the cancer cells. We can have a gene that affects the size of the eye of the fruit flies. If you have too much of it, the eye becomes really small. We have found that this gene is antagonized by another gene that makes the eye bigger. We have came to these uh, two genes only by comparing different maps that we have generated of activities. Now we can ask, can the gene, let's say B, that makes the eye bigger or does not make the eye smaller, affect the gene that make the eye smaller. So we create a fruit fly that has both genes, and we find that the eye is now normal. Instead of having a small eye, we get a normal eye. And we can continue this experiment and say, is the enzymatic activity of the gene B that makes the eye bigger required for this process? Can we save a small eye fruit fly with an active enzyme or with a non-active enzyme. As, as we predict, only the active enzyme can rescue or save and change the small eye to become a big eye. Meaning that our preliminary prediction that two genes have some kind of play between one to another is really true. But this is true in fruit flies, on, fruit flies only. Now we go to the cancer cells and we ask, we have gene A and B, do they have this relationship all also are holding true in uh, cancer cells. And so we can, let's say, gene A makes cells, co a cancer cell move, and the other gene prevent them from movement. Can we see it really happening when we mix the two? So we put gene A, the cells start to move. This is very similar to the process that cancer cells send di distant metastasis, that they send uh, cancer cells all around. Now we enter gene B, and the cancer cells stop moving. The idea that gene A and gene B are antagonizing each other, and gene B would prevent the activity of gene A, comes from the genetic experiment that show us that gene A and B can decide the size of the eye. And this experiment started when we made maps, and we came to the point that really they control a shared group of red lights of genes that are uh, common. It takes this kind of a journey. It's not a one-month journey, 
but it's much easier when it's done in one lab. It's about a year process.